Hello Year 11, this is Lesson 7 in this booklet B2.4 Variation and Evolution. The next three lessons all link together. I'm going to split them up into theories of evolution today, touching a little bit on natural selection, a separate lesson on natural selection, and then a lesson um, purely about Charles Darwin and his research and his work, okay, and the impact of that. So today's lesson objective is learning to understand what's meant by natural selection and how it leads to evolution and how we came about this theory of natural selection through other theories. So you need to turn to page 28 in your booklet for me, please. And we're going to look at three um, theories on evolution. Creationism is the first one. And uh, if you were a religious person, okay, um, prior to Darwin's theory that was created, okay, um, then you would have believed in the theory of creationism. Basically, in the Bible, uh, it states that all organisms on earth were created by God in six days and on the seventh day, the Sabbath, he rested. So people believed mainly in this theory of cre uh, creationism and mainly Christian public. And they believed that man was created in the image of God and that the idea that we could have anything um, in common with apes, that we were um, related to apes and chimpanzees was nothing short of blasphemy. So people were really unhappy when Darwin first published his work because not only did he say that species could change from one form into another, he also claimed that humans had evolved from apes, okay? And the other thing was that Darwin had worked with a Welsh gentleman called um, Alfred Russell Wallace and uh, he hadn't even credited Wallace with um, helping him to work on his theory, so Wallace was not amused. So what I would like you to do is to pause the video at this point and just write a couple of sentences stating what you understand by this theory of creationism, okay? Um, that it was m what most Christian public believed in, okay, um, before Darwin. Thank you. So the second theory that we're going to look at is the theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics and this theory was um, made by Lamarck and Lamarck as we can see up here in the top um, right hand corner and you've got him on page 28 you can see a little picture over him his theory was discredited in other words okay his theory was wrong now we're going to go through um, why he came up with um, his theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics and then why it is wrong and why Darwin's theory is the one that we traditionally um, believe in today. So basically Lamarck um, lived in a village where there was a, a smith, um, uh, what we call a smithy, okay, uh, uh, where they um, heat up metal, okay, and create the horseshoes, okay, for um, the horses and various other things where um, metal products are required. And the story goes that um, Lamarck noticed that the um, blacksmith was quite muscular, had very, very big muscles, okay? And this was more than likely because the blacksmith was working in a physical job all day, okay, and his muscles were developed. But Lamarck also noticed that the blacksmith's son also had big muscles. And so he assumed wrongly that um, because the blacksmith had big muscles, that the son had inherited the big muscles. But in actual fact, it was because the blacksmith's son was um, roped into the family business, okay, and was doing the same job as his father, quite a physical job, um, which is why he developed his muscles. So if we look at this theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics, it was basically he thought that if an organism experienced something, then it could be passed on through inheritance to the offspring. So, for example, someone who works out will develop bigger muscles. However, this characteristic will not be passed on to your children normally. OK, but this is what he thought. So if we apply it to this idea about giraffes, we know that originally there were giraffes with short necks as well as long necks. In other words, there was variation amongst the giraffe population. Um, how do we know this? Well, we know from the fossil record. Scientists have found fossilized, fossilized remains of giraffes where the giraffes have much shorter necks than others. 
So Lamarck would have said that initially giraffes all had short necks, um, and we know this from the fossil record, and he would have said that giraffes stretched their necks so they could reach the leaves higher up the tree, and this made their necks longer. And when they reproduced, they passed on this acquired feature to the next generation. So eventually all giraffes had long necks. So we know that this theory is definitely wrong. This would be the equivalent of me saying, because I'm uh, a little bit challenged in the height department, if I walk around on my tippy toes, okay, and stretch myself, then I will get taller. And then when I have children, my children will be taller. And we know that this is not true. I'm afraid it simply doesn't happen, okay? So that was Lamarck's theory. So what I would like you to do is to pause the video and just write a few sentences on um, Lamarck's theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics and why it is wrong. And then we're going to look at the last theory. So this is Darwin up in the top right corner here, okay? And his theory is the one that is widely accepted currently in our time. There are other theories, okay? So there's something called intelligent design, which is currently out there, okay, as a, a new theory on evolution. However, it is not taught in schools. There is no scientific evidence currently for um, the theory of intelligent design and so this is the one that we teach in schools okay as the um, the theory of evolution that we currently believe in okay so what is Darwin's theory of evolution well he also calls it the theory of natural selection so we can see it here in our PowerPoint we know, now know that only changes to an organism's genes can be passed on to the offspring, not changes that are acquired during an organism's lifetime. So if we use the example of the giraffes that we used in Lamarck's theory, Darwin also noticed that there was variation amongst the population of giraffes, okay? And he said that these differences might be due to their genes, which we now know the differences are caused by something called mutations. Obviously, Darwin didn't know about mutations at this time, but he called them like changes, okay? Not all of the organisms in the population would survive due to starvation, disease, or being eaten by predators. So note that their survival is affected by the changes in the environment. So say these giraffes are all eating the leaves on the tree and they've eaten all the ones on the lower branches. So our poor little short neck giraffe here, he can't reach the leaves up here. So he's going to end up um, having to spend more time looking for food and less time, okay, being able to breed and pass his genes on. So he's less likely to survive. Our taller giraffe here, he doesn't have to spend so much time looking for food because he can reach the leaves on the upper branches. So he spends less time looking for food and more time breeding and passing his genes on. So as it says here, some of the variations like um, longer neck length is an advantage. Having a longer neck means you can reach higher up um, to the leaves. So when food is scarce, the lower down shorter neck giraffes spend more time looking for food and may not survive to be able to breed and pass their genes on. Surviving giraffes will be able to mate and pass their genes on to the next generation, resulting in more giraffes with long necks and the shorter necked ones dying out. So this is the theory we're believing at the moment. I want you to note, okay, in this text, and I've purposely put it in bullet points because when you're answering an exam question, um, there are normally at least four marks that you can pick up on this type of question. And it lends itself perfectly to QWC, quality of written communication responses or quality of extended response. So they would be looking in your response, okay, for you identifying that there were differences within a population of organisms. In other words, variation. They would be looking for you to explain that these differences would be caused by mutations in the genes, changes in the genes. That some of the population would survive because it would be an advantage to have these differences for whatever reason. And you'll see lots of examples that we're going to do over the next two lessons. And that if it's an advantage and you survive, you can mate, or another word they use is breed, and pass your genes on. 
So whenever you're answering a question on natural selection, and you'll see lots of examples coming up, okay, we're looking for these words. And I'll come up with a, a little thing to help you remember these in order. So I want you to pause the video, give me an explanation of Darwin's theory on natural selection. You can use the example of the giraffes if you like. So here's an example of a GCSE question on natural selection. So this one says giraffes feed on the leaves of trees and other plants in areas of Africa. They are adapted through evolution to survive in their environment. And this is on page 29 in your booklet. Use the information in the picture to give one way in which the giraffe is adapted to its environment. Explain how Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who lived 1744 to 1829, accounted for the evolution of the long neck. Now, there are three marks here. So even though Lamarck's theory is wrong, you need to get the basis of how he thought we had long neck giraffes um, uh, suddenly um, evolving in the environment. And then... Another scientist, August Wiseman, so it wasn't just Darwin and Lamarck and creationism, there are lots of other theories out there. Um, he lived between 1834 and 1914. He wanted to check Lamarck's explanation. So to do this, he cut off the tails of a number of generations of mice and looked at the offspring. Not a very pleasant thing to do, okay? Um, his results did not support Lamarck's theory, explain why, and that's worth two marks, okay? And then the final part to this question, part D, explain how Charles Darwin from 1809 to 1882 accounted for the evolution of the long neck in giraffes. And there it is, it's worth four marks. So this whole question is worth 10 marks. Pause the video, have a go at answering those questions and I'll go over the answers with you in a second. So first of all, for A, use the information in the picture to give one way in which a giraffe is adapted to environment. Either it has long neck or long legs, okay, to help it reach the leaves higher up. Explain how Jean-Baptiste Lamarck accounted for evolution of the long neck and giraffes. Well, there are three marks to get here. First of all, he would say that there might have been a change in environment, that the um, leaves on the trees, as the trees got bigger, okay, um, there were only leaves on the top. Or that they would have to reach for food, or they would have to stretch um, their um, neck or their legs, okay. This would then lead to an increased size or characteristic acquired during the lifetime. So if you've described that their neck got longer, then that would be your second point. That this characteristic would then be passed on to the offspring. Obviously, we know that this um, theory is wrong, okay, in its explanation of how we've got long neck giraffes, but a description of it is fine. Why did this scientist August Weissman's results not support Lamarck's theory when he cut off the tails of a number of generations of mice? It's because um, phenotypic changes do not affect the genotype or genes. In other words, okay, if you do something to the animal, cutting off their tails, for example, <clears throat> it doesn't affect the genes of the mice, and so they will still pass the genes onto the offspring. So the offspring would be born with tails, or the inheritance has to be genetic. Finally, for D, the um, Charles Darwin explanation, the four marks here. You need one mark for each of the following points. So you can see very clearly that there's variation within the population, or if you've written it specific to giraffes, you might say, well, there's some tall, and there are some short neck giraffes. This is because, oops, apologies, mutations have occurred yeah so you could say that all giraffes are different or reference to short neck giraffes that some individuals would have there's that word again advantage so already we've used variation mutation yeah advantage they will be better adapted or there is survival of the fittest okay this is another way we describe natural selection and that these taller giraffes or those with longer necks will have an advantage to be able to reach high vegetation or there is a survival of the fittest ones. And I personally would go on and I would include that last mark to say that these ones that have survived, that are 
fittest can breed and pass that on. Okay, that always helps you to pick up a point that perhaps you might have missed out. So check your answers, give yourself a score out of 10 for what you think you got for that and write in any bits that you've missed out, okay? And there we are, there's the advantages, they breed more, okay, in that, that last bit there. So these are the essential steps that you need to know for natural selection, okay? Notice how it's the same series of steps occurring in explaining all of the different examples of natural selection that we're going to do today and in the next lesson. And the way you can remember it, okay, is to take the first letter of each of these words and remember its order, V-M-A-S-B-G. So if you can remember that, you could make yourself up some kind of mnemonic, okay, um, to help you remember these steps. So mnemonic is a phrase where you've got um, the first word, so very, m, many, very many adults uh, sit by the garden, okay, something along those lines, okay. I'm sure you can think up of a better one than that, okay. And so you've got to remember what these letters stand for. So the V is variation. The variation or variety amongst the species occurs due to mutation, the changes in the genes. This might provide the organism with an advantage. It might be the reverse. It might be a disadvantage. It's going to make it more likely not to survive. An advantage would mean they're more likely to survive. If they survive, they can breed or mate, okay, so that the successful genes get passed on. And as I said, the opposite to that, why species die out and become extinct, which we're going to cover in a few lessons time, is that the variation due to a mutation is not an advantage, it means that more organisms are less likely to survive. So they don't go on and breed and mate and their genes don't get passed on. OK, so think of both sides of it. OK, natural selection, essential steps. You have to have variety caused by mutation. It has to be advantageous in order for the organism to survive, breed and pass the genes on. But whenever you're using this um, series of steps to explain it, you've got to relate it to the example that it's given you. You will not just pick up the marks by saying these words. You have to relate it to the example, okay? So it's probably one of the harder types of questions, okay, in the GCSE exam. So to relate this, okay, to uh, an example, we're going to look at rabbits, an example of how evolution works. So it's a series of slides here. Now you've got page 30, you've got um, a page of A4 um, paper. And what I would like you to do is you can either pause the video as I'm going through and explain what's going on, describe and explain how the coat color of rabbits, so we can see we've got some dark, bluey gray, gray, uh, pale uh, buff kind of color here, a darker brown and white rabbits, okay? Um, I want you to describe and explain how the coat color of rabbits evolved in this particular desert habitat that we've got, okay? So you can either, as I say, pause and write it down as we're going through or play the whole thing through and then rewind and write down your version. So once upon a time, there were rabbits in a desert and they were happy and bred like rabbits. Rabbits notoriously have large numbers in their litter. There was variation in the population. Some rabbits were darker, some were lighter. It didn't matter though, they were all happy rabbits. But then the hawks discovered the rabbits and the hunt was on. On one side of the desert was lighter in colour. So this is your lighter side of the desert and this is darker, the soil in the desert. So because the sand was lighter in colour, it made it easier for the hawks to see and catch very dark rabbits or very light rabbits. So you can see the white ones, okay, and these darker brown ones, okay, um, they were easier to spot. On the other side, on the darker side, it was easier for the hawks to see and catch either light or very dark rabbits, okay? So uh, they could spot our rabbits this colour and this colour here. 
Because of the selection pressure of hawk predation, what that means is because the hawks were selecting for the rabbits that were easier to spot, that were not camouflaged, so that's a key word. I'll put the spelling up the top there because camouflage is something that is frequently misspelt. It's got this U in the middle. The frequency of traits, okay, in other words, features in the population of rabbits began to change. So we've got a change in the numbers of the different colours of rabbits. So on the side with the lighter soil, on this side over here, the dark and the very light rabbits disappeared eaten by the hawks. And so you can see the ones that are surviving are the same kind of colour as their background soil. They were camouflaged and so they were less easy to spot by the hawks. On the other side, the light and very dark rabbits were eaten first. And over time, on both sides of the desert, okay, we had whatever rabbits seemed to merge into the colour of the soil best were the ones that survived. Since rabbits tend to breed with nearby rabbits, most of the light coloured rabbits bred with other light coloured bunnies. So we had large numbers of their offspring being the same kind of colour. The bunnies born without good camouflage were very quickly eaten up. So you were unfortunate enough to be darker or lighter, you were easier to spot by the predators. On the other side, the darker coloured rabbits bred with the other dark coloured rabbits and had mostly dark coloured offspring. And any bunnies that were born without good camouflage, again this type, okay, this type, and these, okay, were also quickly eaten up. Over time, the two rabbit populations began to look very, very different, with a higher frequency of the trait, the genes for lighter coats on this side of the desert and a higher frequency of the darker gene on the other side of the desert. Since the selection pressure was maintained by the hawks predating only the bunnies they could spot easily, the genes for the dark coats were pretty much wiped out in rabbit population on light soil, so you didn't get to see any dark coated rabbits on this side. And the same happened on the other side, you didn't get to see any paler coated rabbits okay, living on the dark soil. Then one year, a mighty rain cut a new flood channel in the desert, separating the two populations of rabbits from each other, because rabbits are not notoriously good swimmers. Since they could no longer mingle and exchange DNA, the separated populations of rabbits became more and more unlike each other. And this is how you get new species created, what we call speciation. Over time, they became so genetically different that even when a rabbit managed to hop its way over the river or float on a log, okay, they couldn't interbreed again. The frequency of genes had changed so dramatically that the rabbits had become two distinct species. Evolution is the change of trait or features, gene frequencies in a population over time. And natural selection happens when something about the environment like the soil, colour or predation makes an animal's traits either more fit or less fit. In other words, advantageous in that given environment. If an animal's traits are a better fit to the environment and therefore result in more offspring, the number of critters having those traits will increase, okay? So we can see we've got an increase in the darker here. But if an animal's traits are worse fit to the environment, like these little bunnies here, it will result in less, less offspring and the numbers of critters having those traits will decrease. Selection pressures can be complex, leading to complex adaptations. So let's say some coyotes now move in. Faster, skinnier rabbits might have a better chance at surviving to have more offspring with their faster, skinnier genes as they can run away quicker from the coyotes and in other words, survive to breed and pass their genes on. While on the other side, the sandier soil makes it easy to dig burrows and smaller, fatter rabbits with a tendency to burrow have a better chance at surviving to breed more small, fat burrowing rabbits because they can escape by hiding. So the difference in fitness between competing animals doesn't have to be big to matter. 
If a trait gives a, a critter, an animal, a slight advantage that results in a few more offspring, there will be slightly more of those advantage, advantageous genes in the population to pass on to the next generation. Over time, even these slight adaptations can add up as the trait gene frequencies are pushed in different directions in response to selection pressure. So the relationship between animals and the selection pressures of their environments can be outrageously complex. All creatures on the planet today are the result of millions and millions of years of these interactions. Generation after generation of natural selection for traits or genes that just are a little bit more fit for each population's unique and changing environment. Yet for each species and each adaptation, the underlying mechanism is the same. In response to selection pressure, the frequencies of traits and the genes controlling those traits change in a population over time, and that's called evolution. Back when you did your lesson on mutation, I don't know if you can remember that far back um, in uh, the booklet, so it would be on page, where are we, page 22, there's a really significant word equation and it says mutation equals variation. And that this variation and natural selection, in other words, selecting for the best features, gives us evolution. So the easy way to explain this sentence here is that mutation Differences in genes, okay, will lead to variation, variety, frequency of traits. And natural selection, okay, um, selecting for the traits that are best suited to an environment will lead to evolution. So, pause the video, have a go at writing down your um, description and explanation about how coat colour of the rabbits changed in the desert environment story that I've just told you. And we will go on to look at wading birds in our next lesson. Thank you.